this is the first of our conversations about free body diagrams. We're going to have a lot of them over the course of the semester because they are so crucial to what we're going to actually do in statics. What we're looking with in statics in general is how the equations of equilibrium apply to our various objects. We're looking at Newtonian mechanics for things that are not deforming or accelerating. The free body diagram is the principal method of communicating about how those things are interacting with the rest of the world. Specifically, what I want to do is free the body from whatever else it's attached to so that I can consider just how the forces are interacting on my object. It is a primary communication tool. Um, what we're going to sort of look at is replacing the constraints of our system with the equivalent forces and moments. Over the course of the semester, we're going to do this over and over again. The easiest way to start is to think about a block sitting on a table. If I want to consider the free body diagram of the block, I will consider just the block. I free the body. I've identified the body. I'm going to free it from the rest of it. But I have to replace how it was constrained before with forces. So before, it was sitting there. I had the weight acting down. And I have a normal force acting up. So my free body diagram will have the weight and the normal force on my block. When we're talking about particles, what we're really looking for is just a very simple question. Where are all my forces concurrent? My object, when I'm talking about particle equilibrium, is usually a dot. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at how the forces interact at that point. When we move on, we're going to have a lot of different kinds of objects. It will still be important for you to identify what it is you're considering your equilibrium of. And the last thing I want to sort of say is it is a, a communication tool between the engineering community, and it is important that you follow the rules so that you actually are going to maintain that communication. It's kind of like learning a different language. If you go to Greece and you learn to speak Greek, you don't immediately start by making up your own science fiction words. You have to learn the language that exists before you can go off and make your own rules. So when we talk about freeing the object, I said that we were going to free this block by replacing the normal force. In general, what you're looking at is these questions. Is it held from going up and down? Yes, so when I free it, I have to replace that force so that it's still held from going up and down. Is it held from going right and left? Well, not now, but if I put my hand on it, it certainly is. So if you were going to draw the free body diagram of this system, you would take away my hands and replace them with forces appropriate to what my, I was doing with it. If you have a rope attached to your object, like this, when I draw the free body, meh, not like this. Much more attached than that. When I draw the free body diagram of this particular situation, what I'm going to end up with... I'm not ending up with it very well. Well, anyway. I'm going to replace that object. I'm going to get rid of the rope. I'm going to replace it with the forces that act along the rope. So if your ropes came out at some sort of angle, then your constraints have to come out at that angle. I like to use the image of a black box from like computer science or something like that. If you have an object, all I want to know is what's happening from the outside to the inside and vice versa. So I don't care what's happening on the inside. That's, that's the notion of this black box. I don't know what happens inside and I don't really care. Um, you can also think about a cell wall. If you're talking about a cell, cell transport takes ions and things from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. That's what we're talking about. I do not care about what's happening in the nucleus. The inside of this is not pertinent. Now, every force has to be labeled. And when I say labeled, what I mean is I want to say not this is the force that comes from the normal, normal from the table. I want it to say N because it serves as like the map key for your um, equations. As an engineer, if I look at your equations of equilibrium, I don't know what F is, and I don't know what Q is, and I don't know what S is. You have to tell me what those are. Those labels become understandable from your free body diagram. Um, every force has to have a direction so that I know which direction you assumed it went in. I presume if you're drawing the force of the normal force, it's going to go up. That has to actually look like this. Um, there are some people who like to draw springs forces differently than all the other forces. That's not generally what we're going to do here. If it's a force, it's a force. It looks like that. Um, and only one force per direction. So if you have this block that's got a, my hand on it and the normal force from the table, 
we can't really solve from two things independently. Or if I have my hands on either side of this block. Either the block is pushing this way from all the rest of the forces on it, in which case my reaction is going to the left. Or all the rest of the forces on the block are going this way, in which case my reaction is going to the right. You're only going to get one or the other of them. You're never going to have a situation where the, block, the rest of the forces on the block are making it go in both directions unless you broke it. So we're only going to have one force per direction in general. With our current equations of equilibrium, we can't solve for anything that's collinear. And we'll see that in our next slide.